Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again to being here. Uh, we're really excited. This is going to be your second interview. For this one, we have our grand friend and my personal mentor, Dr. Peter Ferro from New York. Fantastic, uh, yes. Hey, Peter, how are you today? Good, Hamid. Hi, Javier, how are you? We Great excellent. to see you. I'm, uh, I'm not in New York, as you could see from the background. I'm at my house in Pennsylvania on our back porch. And um, I'm happy to be here. And I think the interview this morning of you two discussing, I'm very excited about hearing these other speakers. And uh, we are with you. Uh, May, I'll, I'll celebrate my 47th anniversary in dentistry. Oh, wow. Uh, so I was asking 20, Peter this morning for how many day, years he's been practicing neuromuscular dentistry. And he said about 27 years. So yeah. can you briefly can tell us a little story how you get involved with the physiological occlusion? Just a little bit yeah. before we start with the yeah, question. Well, I started, you know, in dental school, we studied Ramford and Nash was the Bible of occlusion during dental school in the early 70s. I graduated in 73, I started my practice, I listened to Dawson, I listened to a lot of the other speakers in occlusion. I could never got down uh, the romancing the mandible because every time I touched someone's mandible, I felt resistance. I was trying to maneuver it, I was asking them to relax, but you could feel the tension in their muscles. So I, I went on doing my dentistry, not changing vertical dimension, you know, keeping all the- uh, One habitual bite, basically. Yeah, yeah, keeping a habitual bite, maybe opening them a millimeter, two millimeters, but I was afraid to do anything else because I was told that would bring on disaster. Some of my full mouth cases, which I used to do quadrant at a time, were very successful. Some cases failed. I had porcelain chipping, I had crowns breaking. I had patients uncomfortable. And I thought, geez, I did everything right. The occlusion's perfect. And I just unhappy because I ended up, which was very unfair to the patient, but I ended up blaming the patient. Oh, she's the one that never wears her night guard. That's why she has that discomfort or she grinds her teeth all the time, and that's why she broke the crown. And so, how was that first experience that somebody mentioned, look at this, this is different. Yeah, well, my very good friend, and he was my dentist, got into neuromuscular dentistry and was listening to Dr. Gerber since 1984. About 1990, he bought, uh, which was K6 computer, uh, a myotronics piece of equipment. And I thought he was crazy. I thought he was absolutely out of his mind. I said, what are you doing with this thing? So he put me on it. And immediately when he tends me, got my muscles relaxed and went to take a bite, I realized what me trying to romance the mandible was setting up proprioception in, in the patient to resist some of the movements I wanted them to make, where I found that this way he never touched me and we, had a comf we wound up with a comfortable bite. I was given an orthotic and then in 1992 or three, I started studying with him. Then I went on to Dr. Mazzacco, Dr. Gerber, um, uh, Dr. Jenkelson, when I could hear him, but really- Well, you pretty much are been. seeing the expressions of neuromuscular dentistry in different directions in these 27 years. Oh how my you gosh. Can, how you can describe this evolution? Are the concepts uh, having some modifications, some changes? What do you your perception about uh, the entire concept of the different modalities in neuromuscular. Well, I think we, we've made a lot of progress. In the beginning, we didn't have EMGs, we didn't have sonography. 
but that, that wasn't the important thing to me. Uh, the important thing to me became after I started treating patients is I realized that all patients cannot be treated the same. Uh, you could have a protocol, you could have uh, uh, instrumentation, but you have to take a look at the patient. And I realized at times I was either over opening their vertical or pushing them too far protrusive. The, the muscles seem to be comfortable there. So I thought, oh, then that's the place to put them. Wow, put them as far forward point. or wide open. But then they would come back to me and say, Dr. Farrow, you know that, that pain in my joint is better, but boy, my neck is killing me. And I thought, well, I took away her worst pain. So the second worst pain is showing up. Then when I started to investigate neck posture, with Dr. Rocabato, and this is when the light went off on my head. I said, how could you move someone's mandible or change their vertical dimension or change the horizontal position of their mandible without seeing the compensation that they're gonna make in their neck, their shoulders, their back, their hips? And so uh, I took Dr. Rocabato uh, the, Dr. Rockabato was mentioned many times when uh, Dr. Gerber and Dr. Mazzacco would speak about temporal mandibular joint position. So when I saw him in uh, advertisement for him in cranial, uh, giving a course one block from my office, I was very lucky to have an office in New York where people come to lecture. And um, I took his course, 29 PTs and myself three days, three, uh, four three-day courses, one in the spring, summer, fall, winter. And they were eye-opening. And when he started to manipulate and show us how the neck should, the, uh, you know, the lordotic curve in the neck should be, the light went off again. Here it was. I was pushing these people's mandibles too far forward or opening them too far. And what was happening was they would lose the uh, occiput to C2 space on their top of their cervical vertebrae. So this led me into thinking, okay, what else am I missing here? Where else, where does this go? You know, what, if I'm changing their mandibular position and that changes their neck, what else is happening? And that brought me to uh, start investigating uh, fascial release. Tom Meyer's book, The um, Fascial Trains, is an excellent book to start to understand how uh, the body is connected with fascia. And uh, once, you, once you torque or tighten the fascia over a long period of time, you have to release it or that part of the body isn't gonna be able to accept a normal posture again. So, can, so you can tell that one part, every time that you start studying physiological occlusion, one subject giving you, bringing you to the next subject to investigate and learn, yes. because technically it's like an eyes opener that allows to see different perspective or connections that we never even considered yeah. that they were part of the question. Right. So the, that's the bright, the, the brighter the light, the more darkness you see. Yeah, definitely. And so, uh, it, and what do you think about the contemporary neuromuscular dentistry? What do you I think, think it has been changing over time? Um, I I think there it, it's changing. It's changing slowly because I I feel that um, you know it takes a long time to master. Uh, neuromuscular techniques, but if you're not looking further, then you're going to run into a roadblock where you're going to stay in that rut. You're going to do the same thing to every patient. If it turns out fine, you're the successful one. If it turns out wrong, it's the patient's fault. I don't accept that. I, I feel you have to take the techniques you have and then open up your eyes, see their posture, 
Dr. Bricot from Marseille, France, is the one who taught me about posture. He starts with posture. And the reason I was interested in his course because his fourth level of alignment is the mandible in relationship to the maxilla. He realizes if that component isn't correct, then he's not going to have the feet on the ground, the knees uh, knock kneed or bowed legged, the rotation of the pelvis the uh, loss of the lower dotted curve in the lumbar spine, and then shoulder girdle comes forward and rounded up and forward. And then the neck, you go into a forward head posture and you destroy the lower dotted curve in the cervical spine. So, you know, all these things keep uh, coming up. And when you're treating a patient, you have to treat the whole patient. You cannot just treat their occlusion. I'm sorry, uh, un unless your definition for occlusion is how the teeth fall on the teeth. Well, we're going to get there. We're going yeah, no, oh, to get to that. We're going to get to the questions. That. We're going to get to the I'm questions. Sorry. And... Uh, I've always had this uh, That's verbal okay. diarrhea I know, problem. I know. It's not an easy job, <laughs> but I have to do it. So, okay, uh, so basically, uh, <laughs> no, we would just wanted to see uh, the, the evolution and, and the changes, how you went through um, your own personal uh, uh, evolution of seeing how you treat your patients. Yeah, well, I, I look at them as they walk in the room. I evaluate their posture first, because if I'm going to be successful in doing what I want to do, restore their mouth or get them out of pain, then I'm going to have to maybe manipulate their man mandibular position, but that's going to affect the rest of them. And if they have blockages like a cervical blockage or shoulder girdle blockage or even hips or in lower back, then that's going to prevent me from getting the, uh, to achieve the uh, result I want to see. Plus, we want to get them completely better, not just part of them better. Perfect. I mean, it's a great point because uh, we do see that, um, obviously, you can't, you can't say that what we do affects the posture, but the posture is not going to affect what we do. It's a two-way street. And uh, we need to prevent ourselves from falling into that effect and saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to do my job and everything is automatically going to work out. Um, and that, that's another mistake. So uh, point well taken. Thank you. All right. Now okay. we're getting to our um, uh, uh, 45 minutes uh, left. And uh, I think we should get ahead uh, with okay. our questions. What do you think, Javier? Yeah, I think it's time to start going to these points. Remember for the audience, the people that is watching this, remember that the objective that we want to see is how many things we have in common. Uh, Dr. Ferro is a big representative of the neuromuscular. He's part of the College of International uh, International College of Craniomandibular Orthopedics. And as I say, he's been a great mentor for me. But what I like for him is that big open mind that he's been looking in different directions without dogma, just trying to to get more information about all these interdisciplinary components in the human. Uh, that is, we need to be aware to be able to treat this kind of patient. So I think, yes, you go, go ahead and start with the question. Fantastic. Okay, Dr. Farrell, um, I think you've explained some of this, but in a few words, please just uh, tell us what is occlusion to you and uh, who were your influences? I think you kind of already told us the influences, but yeah, just tell us what is occlusion to you. Uh, occlusion, I start with, um, if, if we're taught, I was taught occlusion is the teeth, how the teeth meet and how the teeth function on top of each other. But what my approach is to make sure that the maxilla is in a proper relationship to the base of the skull, uh, cranial base, to make sure the mandible what relationship does that have in position does that have when you're in maximum intercuspation to the base of this uh, cranium then the relationship of the maxilla to the mandible and whether they have a proper relationship then uh, comfort of the muscles joint position neck 
shoulder girdle, and the rest of the posture. So occlusion isn't just the teeth on the teeth. The occlusion is the larger parts of the skull, the mandible, maxilla, and their relationship to the skull and the position of the skull on the neck. Yeah, Thank I you. think that's it really important to, 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 to see how it, it gets connected dependent on the information that you're getting. So right. that's, that's amazing. Okay. Very well. Uh, second question is that, uh, which factors do you consider prior to stabilization? Again, I think you've answered a little bit of this in question one, which is the posture and, and sleep. And yeah. But so let's try to talk anyway? then. Yeah, so let's try to create, since uh, um, Peter has been answered some of the question, maybe he can give us like a workflow what can be the events? Uh, I think we're still into the same question, but um, because he already mentioned what he does, so my like uh, the the protocol. Uh, what you want to go? Think? Okay, so so what is the uh, uh, diagnostic records that he takes? Is that yes? Yeah. Uh, question uh, three. Yeah, uh, diagnostic records. Uh, at one time, I used to take seven different. Uh, diagnostic x-rays, uh, lateral cervical spine, uh, lateral supplementary x-ray, frontal uh, uh, supplementary, uh, tomograms of the joints, and, um, and lateral uh, cervical spine x-rays. Now I take a CBCT. Uh, I'm fortunate to have in the office one of the largest screens uh, so we get from top of the head to, or, or even you if mean we field of view. Yeah. yeah, the field of view is the, one of the largest places. So we get down to C5, I think, C4, oh, wow, C5. That's pretty good. So um, in one shot, in ma and I always take it in maximum intercuspation, because if you don't have that patient in maximum intercuspation where they swallow and they chew, then you're not gonna have a representation of what the neck looks like, what the temporal mandibular joint position is. So that- Yeah, that is a great point because I'm seeing multiple <laughs> people and it's mostly because the scattering created in the CVCT, if the patient has crowns or metal in the mouth. Yeah. So they try to put the teeth apart to try to reduce the scattering of the, the, in the X-ray. But unfortunately, they lose big part of the diagnostic that, that is to see what is the relation between the occlusion, the condyles, and the, the cervical spine in right. one spot. So yeah, this is a great point to take over with the x-rays with the teeth together. So um, uh, Dr. Ferrer, do you, do you use other uh, instrumentation such as? Oh, uh, oh absolutely. Tracking? Yeah, okay. jaw tracking, <laughs> joint sounds, you know, sonography. I use... Um, EMGs, of course, which is, is Do very you MRIs important. routinely on your patients? No, not routinely. When I need, when, when I feel that I'm not seeing what I want to in just the hard tissue CBCT, then I'll ask for an MRI. Okay. Uh, but the, I was impressed watching uh, Javier's video that um, emotion, uh, MRI, I think, is is the most diagnostic thing we could get. Not a yes, station. Unfortunately, not too many of them around. Yeah. No, there is. There's also a uh, uh, complex motion um, tomography unit that chiropractors use uh, for because many cervical um, uh, injuries are not visible on a static x-ray and so fluoroscopy uh, you mean a pardon like fluoroscopy yeah it is like a fluoroscopy but it's not done with a fluoroscope of course it's done and uh it's a dmx machine and it was invented by a chiropractor and from florida and you'll actually see when they take one of these of the cervical spine uh dr Roccobato has uh uh one lecture where he shows that the dens was totally fractured from C2. And when the person's head would go back and forth, C1 would slide almost all the way off of C2. So uh, these diagnostic, these 
pieces of diagnostic equipment are you, you I don't like to live without anymore. You, you become spoiled because you're seeing so much more. So, um, and, and uh, you know, I do still jaw tracking. Listen, I'm, I'm based in neuromuscular, so I use those techniques to the best of my abilities. Perfect. But I find that if I repeat those tests after the phase one, I call phase one just getting someone out of pain and getting them comfortable chewing, eating with the orthotic in, then I, of course, reevaluate them every step, reevaluate them before orthodontics, reevaluate them after orthodontics, before I start any prosthetics. And I wanna check when, when I, um, I wanna check and make sure that the joint is in the right position, they have comfortable muscles before I commit them to any kind of extensive uh, prosthodontic. Now, let me ask you something now that you mentioned in mm -hmm. this. Is your vertical dimension taken as a consideration during the different phases? Uh, what is your consideration to take oh, your vertical dimension? Yeah, well, if I have a patient who has extreme pain and I find that they have a very compressed joint, they still have movement, they're not locked, and they don't have a lot of adhesions, they have good movement, only they're uncomfortable, I may over open their vertical to get a swelling out of the joint without over opening them, of course, but maybe open them more than I would if I was going to restore them. When okay. I restore them, I I'm close gonna, them back down. I'm going to jump in a second because Javier kind of had bypassed question five. We probably <laughs> oh. can't oh. your speech. Your speech okay. already, so far, we know that you do have an interdisciplinary approach, and that was yes. question number five. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, okay. A question about the vertical. Yeah. Question number six. Oh, and I'm I, sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's I'm sorry. okay. No, my bad. That's, okay. That's why but, I'm here. Um, let's let's go back to uh, the therapies I use. I okay, use a so. my, myofunctional therapist for and make sure that the patient doesn't have a tongue swallowing habit, a tongue thrust, or okay. tied tongue. Okay, we want to get those out of the way because uh, it, we may not need it immediately it, it, to get them out of pain, but they definitely, before we start any orthodontics or any prosthetic reconstruction, they have to have a free tongue, relaxed hyoid bone. Uh, I use physical therapists, chiropractors, nuca chiropractors, upper cervical chiropractors. I also uh, have posturologists I send, pay, even though I'm trained in posturology, I have posturologists I send to cranial sacral uh, release techniques by certain doctors I work with, um, uh, oral surgeons, physical therapists, they're all very, very necessary. Fantastic, in, no, it's just fascinating. Is an a special frequency that you use when you work with these interdisciplinary people? I, what it, can be your sequence? Well, since, since the patients are coming to see me are usually in pain, I have to quickly make a determination of what's behind the most significant part of their pain management. And yes, I want them to go to a physical. Physical therapy would never hurt anyone before you put the orthotic, after you put the orthotic, after you change anything. Physical therapy is always very good. I've seen Dr. Raccobato work on patients. I've seen hundreds of slides of his where he's gotten people who are very, very uncomfortable just with physical therapy exercises. I show them, I have videos of uh, some of his shoulder girdle exercises. I show patients in the office how to stretch the space between occiput and C2. Um, all these things have to start right away. If, uh, if I see they, they walk up and down the hallway and their one toe is pointed out and the other toes straight, I, I say, look at your feet. You're throwing your, you're making an uneven hip by walking with your toe pointed out. And I get them aware of what they're doing on a daily basis and what they're doing constantly. Correct. To to start to correct their posture. So the sequence is always depends on how they come, what kind of pain they have, 
and how fast we could get them moving. I like a chiropractor to see them. I like uh, if they have a tongue tie or uh, tongue thrust swallowing habit, I want them at a myofunctional therapist. And it's amazing how some myofunctional therapy, they get rid of their headaches and their neck aches because their tongue is so tied that they're compensating with their hired bone and their neck where they should be using their tongue. So, so now, the, effect, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, in effect, <clears throat> what you're doing, you're really resetting the whole system in a neutral position for you before you take your bite, if I understand. Um, it, at times, as much yeah, as, at, as much as I you would, can. I would love to do it in that order, but some patients need something between their teeth so they, uh, the TMJ and the muscular aches and pains stop, then they could work on the rest of their posture. Um, you know, it's, it's so individualized that there, I don't think I could write a, a standard protocol that I use unless I know what, who, who that patient is. Then I could give you a standard protocol because I wanna assess them first. Perfect. Now, one question that it goes with that before we jump to the next question is, yeah. did you notice changes in your occlusion, in your contacts uh, during a treatment that you encourage the patient for instance to go to physical therapy? Let's say that yeah. you took your bar, you start making a stabilization, then the patient uh, is engaged to go for an interdisciplinary treatment with the physical therapy, that patient come back for your office for the physical therapy, can you evidence changes into the occlusion adjustments that you have to do, to, to do or something? Yes, else? yes. Every time they, they uh, correct their posture, their occlusion, uh, I like to keep them in an orthotic during these therapy um, visits because I, I have them make the physical therapy or chiropractic visit um, or massage therapy put cotton between their teeth and come directly to my office for an adjustment. And inevitably, there'll be a change of their occlusion once they have any of these things done. I mean, you have a positive, <clears throat> if you get their mandible in the right position and their occlusion correct, you'll see positive changes in their neck. I had one patient who was extremely kyphotic and I told him, you have to go for therapy. You have to go for therapy. I made him an orthotic and uh, he, he was always rushed when he came in. So I was never able to question him too much. At the end of his four months of uh, orthotic therapy, I took an x-ray of his neck. He had a perfect glorodotic curve. I said, whoa, you really had some good success with your chiropractor and physical therapist. He says, oh, I never went. So, I don't, you know, that was a case where everything was in place except his mandible wasn't in the right place. And as soon as I got his mandible in the right place, then his lordotic curve came back in his neck. But that's not always the case. Most of the time, it's the other way around, where the poor posture and neck posture has caused an occlusal, occlusal wear in certain areas, changed the chew cycle, and we're back to the beginning again. All right. Um, next question is uh, has to do with the, I know um, you do a lot of, uh, in your practice, you do both restorative and uh, orthopedics. Um, so do you, do you, when do you take facial aesthetics as a consideration? That's oh, I think what we want I, to know. I think facial aesthetics right from the beginning. From the beginning. Uh, but we're talking about incisal again, display, gingival display, and all. Oh that. no, 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 no! I, I'm talking about facial aesthetics. Okay. Because we all know uh, from uh, Da Vinci and Michelangelo that the face is three thirds hairline, which I'm losing. <laughs> okay, hairline, to eyebrow, line, <laughs> eyebrow line, eyebrow <laughs> line to tip of nose, tip of nose to the center of the bony part in their chin. Those are three facial thirds. And you don't need my, you could tell someone's vertically compromised if they're overclosed. Uh, both Michelangelo and da Vinci aged a man from 20 to 80 by just pushing the chin closer to the nose and taking some hair out. The rest of his face didn't change at all. And he looks 
80 in the one photograph or sketch and 20 in the other. And that's the only thing he changed, vertical dimension between nose and chin, and he plucked hair out. You know, he, he drew less hair in. So this is, this is very important. I start, I never tried to violate that, but I do violate the vertical opening at times when I feel that the joint was severely compacted and uh, I have to relieve that. Then when I go on to, uh, of course, restorative, then I look at lip, lip posture, how much incise a ledge shows and all of these other factors. But I found a lot of people who are overclosed and lost vertical dimension over the years, they wind up with a very short upper lip. And if you don't put an orthotic or something in there to make up that vertical dimension, and then after four months of that, then take your aesthetic photographs to see how much incisal edge is going to show. Because if they have a short lip and you increase their vertical dimension and the lip comes down, you may be hiding your essentials, which you don't want to do. I mean, Javier is the expert in that. Thank you. Um, the next question I'm going to ask, uh, really knowing that you're not really, you don't do surgeries, but uh, we have talked about uh, the uh, growth factors in PRGF and IPRF. Um, have you, what do you know about that? And, and the, the Well, I've read about it and I've had uh, two patients who've had growth factor injected into their joints, uh, mostly the inferior com uh, synovial compartment. <clears throat> to help regenerate the head of the condyle. And I've had, a, but always after I put an orthotic or something to stabilize their occlusion, okay? And, and I've, uh, I know uh, uh, Dr. Amid and I have worked on a case together because the patient uh, is working in New York and he did growth factor um, uh, when he did surgery before her orthodontics. And this case is incredible. He opened up a four, by, a four by cuspid extraction case that was entirely collapsed and opened her up and regained the space. And I think she's almost due to have the implants put in, right? The implants are in. Oh, perfect. The implants are in. Okay. So this is, of course, <laughs> in our hiatus here. <laughs> we haven't seen any patients. Are you going to uh, jump back in a question? Yeah, um, go ahead that we were talking about uh, which condition, based on the sequence of treatment, but I want to create a specific into the question is, at yeah. the time that you're taking your bites, uh, <laughs> you're taking as a consideration posture, you're taking as a consideration the structural, the conda, in the way that it's sitting, you're taking a consideration the muscles. Now, let me ask you this, what, how you relating the bite registration that you're taking in reference with airway, because that's important. It's a lot of people that is always thinking airway, but I'm seeing cases that they can compromise joint-wise, because eventually right. used to get one factor, maybe you will trigger another one. How you can manage this sequence to have all the harmony of the system, taking a bite that is a good for the muscles, that is a good bite for facilitate the gliding of the jaw surfaces, but also taking as a consideration the airway and the sleep in patients. Um, yeah, because I, I treat a lot of sleep apnea patients, I've been very conscious of the fact that most uh, dentists who treat sleep want to uh, place the patient in uh, three quarters of the protrusive movement. And I find that most of the times this is excessive. It actually, by pushing someone's mandible too far forward, you actually close the airway because the neck it invades the space from uh, the posterior aspect of the airway. So you get a exaggerated um, response. response and uh, you actually close the airway down. I, I also found using the EMGs when I take my um, uh, sleep apnea bites that I could only go so far and then I trigger the uh, omohyoid muscle and the posterior temporalis to start firing. 
I mean, I don't monitor the homo hired muscle, but that's what you're doing when you pull the mandible too far forward. So what is your criteria to have? So you have technically two byte registration. Do you have a byte registration yes. for your all day? So you are you recommending to do two different appliances, one for day, one yes. for night? Yes. What is that handling? How do you how do you how is that? Okay. What do you on, say the people? On every, you? on every sleep apnea patient, even if they don't have TMJ symptoms or symptomatology, I always take two bites. I take a bite in the neuromuscular position first. I check that bite, then I take the sleep apnea bite. And many, many times, it's only a couple millimeter difference between their, uh, their neuromuscular bite, I'm calling it a neuromuscular bite, it's their bite that I feel their habitual occlusion should be in, and then their sleep apnea bite, which is a little more exaggerated opening, a little more exaggerated forward movement, but not forward that far that it closed the airway off in the back. And that's, that's reflected in your uh, CVCT with the bite registration in place. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Uh, I remember back in the day that we used to use fluoroscopies. So, hey, that was oh. the pharyngometers. Oh, pharyngometers. Yeah. Yes, I have one. I did a, I, yeah, I, funny I'm you mentioned that. that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, but, I always had a problem with the pharyngometer because it was um, uh, registering expiration and not inspiration. And I always felt that you could have a, enough volume expiring, but it's different because linear air, when you breathe linear air through your mouth, <clears throat> uh, you will actually collapse the airway. If you breathe air through your nose, your turbinates in your nose start the air circulating. And circulating air will blow up a collapsible tube. And linear air going down a tube, collapsible tube, will actually close it down. So the breath, so I thought that was a little backwards, even though it was a good measure. I always thought it was a little inaccurate because it was on expiration and not inspiration. Now, which kind of management, and Hamid, I think we're good in time, so that's what I'm taking. Uh, we uh, have uh, three more questions, and uh, we have about 20 minutes left. Yeah, so, so I think we're good. Uh, so that's what I'm interfering uh, with the question. Now, because I think this subject is really important about his sleep apnea, and then we didn't put nothing here about sleep directly. And I think taking advantage of the experience of Dr. Ferro, I would like, like now we know what is the consideration, how he takes the bites, and what is his thinking uh, in reference with the muscles and in the joints at the time that he's taking this bite to make these sleep appliances. But also, I would like to know, um, during this process, do you find that you need to bring the patient to some kind of orthopedic treatments? Because many times these problems of the patient being depleted by air can be a structural factor that hyperdevelop maxillas and then, of course, airways. I mean, internal part of turbine, sinus, the entire uh, respiratory system. But so you're doing expansion or how you handle in this uh, uh, cranioskeletical discrepancies, mostly in reference with the maxilla and the mandible? Expansion. Uh, uh, I start all my orthodontic cases with expanders, <clears throat> even if I'm going to finish with Invisalign which um, since my population of treatment of uh, patients is adults and in the business world with responsible jobs, they, none of them want braces, uh, hard wire and brackets on their teeth. And some will, but very few. And most of them go into um, uh, some uh, Invisalign. Uh, as their final movement. But expansion, I like to use appliances. Back to the functional appliances that I was taught when I first started studying orthodontics. Now, can you expand on that? Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Uh, are, we, are we talking about lateral or are, are you always doing? Um, oh, no, three-way. 
three-way. And all three-way SADs are all appliance that uh, we've all Perfect. learned. Push That's the maxilla forward, I mean. spread the palate. Remember that uh, when most of these patients who come in who have habitually breathed through their mouth, the first thing you have to do if you're going to start orthodontics on them is they have to start breathing through their nose. And I explained to patients, the, the palate should be a Romanesque arch. Most patients who have uh, a very narrow maxilla gothic have arch. a Gothic arch. Now, if you have a Gothic arch palate, that's the floor of your nose. If you have a Romanesque palate, that's the floor of your nose, okay? The roof of your mouth is the floor of your nose. The more expansion you get, the wider the base of the nose or, or the floor of the nose is. So you get more air. Uh, you know, many, many uh, ENTs feel that, um, I was always told you had a deviated septum because uh, you had some accident as a kid or some hypertrophy of the turbinates or something. But actually, you, when you think about genetically, <clears throat> we should have a septum that goes up to the base of the skull, from the base of the skull to the floor of the nose. If you have a Romanesque arch it's on your pushing. palate, you have, you have 24 millimeters between the, the uh, base of the skull and the floor of the nose. If you have a Gothic, You've just lost four or five millimeters, but the but the septum is genetically geared to be 24 millimeters. So what are you going to do? You can't put a 10 foot beam in a room that only has eight foot ceiling. You have to bend it one way or bend it the other way, and that's what that's how it develops from birth. That's not a, a, a repercussion of an accident or some hypertrophy. Um, Turbinates. That's what? structural. That's structural. Okay. What do you think is a good age to start treating a kid uh, with the principles <laughs> of functional occlusion? Um, I six, five, four, sometimes three. If you if if you have a, a child who was bottle fed its entire life or breastfed for, let's say, three or four months and then on to a bottle. You're going, you're promoting, unless the baby is fed by breast for a year to a year and a half, they develop a nose breathing habit from the time they're born, the day they're born. The mother's breast will cover the entire lower part of the baby's face, covering the entire mouth. That, child that infant is forced to breathe through their nose so they become a nose breather if you have a mouth breather you're always going to have a narrow arch on a child uh, a lot of tongue tie uh, infants go they go undiagnosed and they become mouth breathers and they and they do not swallow correctly and that just promotes this gothic shape of the palate and then all the breathing problems they have after that and most of these kids, ADD and ADHD, are very, very tied up with child, children with sleep apnea. We have one question here that is say, Dr. Bush is a smile. He say, one bite for a physiological bite, neuromuscular, and a sick one is for the sleep appliances, which right. usually has a bit more vertical dimension and anteroposterior position. Yeah, the, the sleep bite will have a little more vertical to it and a little more anterior movement. But I've had cases where it's been, uh, I take the neuromuscular bite, I check the joint position, I check the muscles. Uh, it seems to be correct uh, uh, through jaw, uh, jaw tracking to make sure they have a nice, beautiful, uh, symmetrical uh, opening and closing trajectory. And then I take their sleep bite and it's two millimeters more open and two millimeters more forward. And the sleep well, lap, and very, very small, very small. Yeah, but how you bring in, how you stimulate in that patient to go to that forward bite? No, I let them protrude 
and relax, separate and let, uh, I mean, I'm using the tension. So we, we have a trajectory and I'll find if I have them protrude and relax and come back a little bit, protrude, come back and relax a little bit, they'll fall two or three millimeters in front of their neuromuscular bite. And I do the same tracing. We still get a trajectory. I have them bite on their back teeth, extend, relax. And I see where the, if the cursor winds back in the same trajectory with all relaxed muscles. All, I, I don't take a bite okay. unless I have relaxed muscles. All right, muscles. I'm sorry, Javier, but we need to stop this. Okay. We have, uh, we're on the last 15 minutes. We have three more questions. Okay, go uh, ahead. I think, I think I know the answer to uh, question number nine, uh, which is, do you notice postural changes after your treatment, expected, unexpected, positive, or negative? Um, uh, I think we can quickly I, go I, through it. Yeah, I, I'm watching their posture the entire time I'm treating them. I don't want to wait till the end to notice something. So, uh, yes, I, I sometimes get negative. Uh, uh, repercussions, sometimes positive. Mo uh, hopefully, I catch it in time that we could do something about it. But the body's going to compensate. You know, it's like everything else. The body will compensate. And uh, well, you have previous. to be very careful, you know, how you maneuver someone down this path, that you're not pushing them off. You know, you're correcting one thing and creating a secondary problem. Fantastic. Um, this is more of a philosophical question. Um, do you consider that at any point the entire field or the field will be open to a more holistic, meaning more organic, and holistic with a W, meaning more entire person uh, approach to occlusion? Uh, yes, I, uh, they ha we have to. We cannot consider ourselves tooth mechanics or I'm going to make the best occlusion possible with like Javier mentioned this morning uh, with a nice tripod occlusion with all the cusps and all the fossa. That's important. That's very important. But to get to that and make the patient comfortable, you have to take all these other things into consideration. We have to, we have to see how they're breathing. Do they have sleep apnea. I got into treating sleep apnea because my patients would come in for TMJ problems. I did, I diagnose them with sleep apnea, send them for a test, and they would put a CPAP on them. I never see them again. So I thought I better start treating this myself. And yes, send them for a sleep test. You can't treat something you don't know whether the patient has it or not. You have to have a sleep right. test. There's no Thank way you. around that. Thank That's you for that. Method. Now, uh, this last question is uh, Javier's uh, baby. Uh, we, uh, we thought that it's also important to know, um, can you describe to us the events that happen in the joint when we open and close? Basically, what we wanna figure out is, what do you think is happening? This whole uh, discussion on <sighs> rotation versus translation, and, yeah. and, and so what is your, what is your uh, uh, and, and what is your ideal position? Can you talk about the ideal, uh, when you finish your case, if yeah. it happened most ideally, where do you want to see uh, your, uh, your condyle? And okay. uh, what type of occlusion scheme, occlusal scheme, scheme you want to see? Okay. Uh, I think that um, a lot of my, uh, the position I favor, a lot of the information comes from Dr. Raccobato because um, he, he stresses the point that you have to have con congruency in the joint. You have to have the head of the condyle, which is convex, against the inner part of the disc, which is concave, and then the um, eminence, the posterior wall of the eminence be in congruency and in close contact with the top part of the disc, which is also concave. So you have a biconcave disc, and if you try to center, like in most joints, center the head of the condyle in the glenoid fossa, that's anatomically almost impossible to have congruency with a 
uh, condylar head in the middle of the glenoid fossa. Glenoid fossa on the top is concave. How are you going to put a concave surface against another concave surface? You either have to have space or the, it's going to push the disc out of position. In, um, I have a little sketch. Do you want me to show the sketch, Javier? Please. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Okay, this is my little sketch. Now, this is the head of the condyle. This is the disc. This is the front part of the eminence. This is the external auditory meatus. Here I left a little space for the petrotampanic fissure. Mm -hmm. And the condylar head should be, Dr. Roccobato's uh, saying is, the condylar head should be halfway, the top of the condylar head should be halfway between the depth of the fossa and the prominent of the eminence. So that's the red line across here. It should lie in the front segment of a line from the external wall, or the, I'm sorry, the posterior wall of the fossa to the height of the eminence. Two lines here, and this is halfway. So there's your head of your condyle. This would be, uh, Javier and I were discussing this earlier, would be like in a two to three o'clock position because the forces of the masseter are in this direction, forces of the anterior temporalis is that way. So you have the most pressure here on the head of the condyle against the, um, in congruency with the disc, biconcave disc, and the posterior part of the eminence here. So that's where I like to keep my um, head of the condyle in the fossa. That's the most my, ideal that's finish my particular, case. I, that's my ideal. That's okay. my and, ideal. And in, in reference to the events that happen, um, do you think there is a, a first a rotation and translation or? I, please expand I, on that. I've yeah, delved just it, a few yeah, more minutes. I've, yeah, I've delved into this pretty deeply. And I'm taking this from a purely, uh, physiological standpoint. The first muscle that engages in opening of the mandible is the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. The only function of that muscle is to pull the mandible forward. After the mandibles open 15 to 20 millimeters, both by gravity, and then you engage the anterior digastric muscle. So if you could create pure rotation in the first 15 to 20 millimeters of opening before you translate, physiologically, the only explanation, unless you have an extreme amount of adhesions and they would have to be in the right place, is that the disc is now anterior to the head of the condyle, they tr you, the patient tries to open and the only thing they could do is rotate first, then translate. So but in other words, it would be a pathologic, it would be a pathologic state. Yes. So only in a pathologic yes, I've, I've model, always, there can be first rotation and then translation. Yeah, they do not happen separately. Translation and rotation happen at the same time. But the initial muscular contraction is lateral, is inferior head of lateral pterygoid. Inferior, which is, yeah. holds the head of the condyle. Right, it ho holds the head of the condyle. And the superior head, actually, they shouldn't be called the same muscle. I've had this discussion with anatomists before. They should be two separate muscles because the superior head of the um, lateral pterygoid muscle is a closing muscle. It holds the disc from falling too far back in the joint. And the sup inferior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle is an opening open. muscle. So you have one muscle that's both opening and closing. Doesn't make sense. But listen, I didn't write the anatomy books. Thank you so much. Uh, Javier, we're at the last five minutes. Anything mm -hmm. you want to add? 
Oh, we didn't even finish. He didn't ask about the scene <laughs> and the occlusion. How he relayed the occlusion between the teeth, Peter? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still go back to nathology. I still like uh, cusp to fossa. Um, I, uh, I've tried to make sure my orthodontic finish and my um, prosthetic finish is with the lingual cusps of the upper posterior teeth resting in the central fossa of the lower posterior teeth and free the cusp, the buccal cusp tips. Too many orthodontists, I feel, they'll take the upper posterior teeth and tip the buccal cusp interproximally in the, between the lower teeth and that just locks them in. These patients, when they've had orthodontics done this way, you see abfractions on all their premolars because they're lock, they're, you're locking their mandible in, into a position that is uncomfortable for them. Now, and how do you handle I, the anterior relationship? How do you anterior, handle the anterior guide? I, I, and all that? Yeah, no, they should have anterior guidance. They shouldn't have more than a millimeter, two millimeter most over over jet or over, over bite. bite and they should have at least one millimeter over jet in front so when they bite in centric occlusion they touch everything from the canines posteriorly and they do not touch any anterior anterior teeth if you have a patient uh, when i first started dentistry i found many patients come in full upper denture partial lower what are the last six teeth in the mouth that are left on these patients? The anterior six teeth, because there's so much proprioception in there, the body does everything to protect those teeth, whether they go into a severe class two or a deep bite where they're biting on the palate, it doesn't matter. Why, were, why are those the last teeth that come out of someone's mouth? Because they're protecting them, body protects them, it's all proprioception. Awesome. I'm sorry, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yes, you did. Okay. So anyway, so for everybody, <laughs> uh, I think this has been magnificent. We can see how an, uh, really an experienced physician treating patients successfully for 40 years, 27 years, doing it, thinking in physiology. It, uh, it, this is shows, first of all, how humble he is and how he finds that it's not only one way of thinking, how we need to combine different aspects. And unfortunately, the more information we have, the more things we know that we need to learn more. And that's why many people also is a little aware to involve too many aspects into the concept of occlusion. Um, that was really key points, what you say. We like a lot that you were able to combine everything with posture, the sleep of the patient. Uh, and it's great the explanation that you tell us about the condylar uh, position and the dynamics. I think tonight this uh, is going to be an amazing wrap up about the concept because tonight at 6 p.m. we're going to have Professor Dr. Mariano Rocavaro talking about the uh, concept of craniocervical stability, but also he will talk about arthrokinematics of the synovial compartment. So we're going to try to Dr. Rocavaro tell us what is the process of the degeneration from a kid to an adult, how we can relate these postural issues in kids all the way to a mature age, that is the time that it comes to our offices to be treated as dysfunction. So he's gonna make like the process of degeneration of, the, of, of these postural changes in complex cases as an adult, but also we're gonna go into details about differences between arthrokinematics and osteokinematics because I think part of the confusion of the definition of the events that happens into the joint is related to you know if it's happening in the bone by itself or it's happening between the internal structures that facilitate the gliding of the surface. So Peter, we want to tell you thank you so much. Oh, you're I very know that Glad to be is, here. It's amazing. We couldn't have an event without you. I will never feel the same <laughs> because I'm who I am because you really inspire me to be in this wow. journey. And I hope we have to your experience and more information for many, many more years. 
Um, thank thank you. you so much. I don't know how many what else you want to say. No, that's it. Thank you so much, Peter. It's great oh, to see you. And thank you for making the time and sharing some of your experience with us. Um, we look forward to your uh, lecture in the, in okay. the marathon. Thank you. Oh, thank all you. right. So thank okay. you guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.